Great, and we are live. Imran, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we're doing um, a series of podcasts for the Dive In Festival, and Imran Qureshi has kindly um, agreed to, to speak to me, uh, which is really cool. Imran, congratulations on your, your new role. So you're officially head of North America for Willis Towers Watson. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, Lewis, and thanks for inviting me on this podcast, and I'm thrilled to be here. Pleasure, pleasure. So we spoke all fair about this a week or so ago, and it's just interesting to hear how an English guy grew up around Harrow, ended up being in Chicago, leading Willis uh, North American division. We'd, we'd love to hear how, how that unfolded. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, at a moment like this, in any kind of pivotal moments in one's careers, it always gives you an opportunity to look back and uh and reflect a little bit around your experiences and and also give thanks to those that have helped you along the way so i i was born and raised in the uk my parents were immigrants to the uk uh father was uh born in pakistan migrated to actually born in india migrated to pakistan right. during the partition made his way to britain in the 60s met my mother who was also an immigrant from trinidad in the west indies and she made her way to the uk in the 60s so that's why i've got this accent um, <laughs> my my parents were uh were seeking to make a, a go of it in the uk in london um so i i was born and raised in the uk um went to university there um, and it ended up uh, embarking upon an actuarial career. But then in 1997, I had an opportunity to come out to the United States. I'd never been to the United States. Our business in the US at the time, it was with another company, had recently um, won a number of clients, but lost a number of people. So there's a bit of a gap around workload. And um, were, you, were you at Willis at the time? Or? I was not. I was at another company. OK, so um, was at a prior company that um, brought me across in 1997 for supposedly one month. <laughs> so I arrived in Chicago uh, on Memorial Day, which is in May um, in 1997 and never been to the US. So, yeah, you know, I was struck at the time by, by just the enormity of everything, the, the buildings. The portion sizes, the the streets, the cars, everything just seemed to be significantly larger than what I'd experienced before, and um, and then I was supposed to be there for one month, but uh, I ended up staying three months, which was the most I could stay without a visa. Came back to the UK to get a visa to arrive then back into the United States on Christmas Eve, nineteen ninety seven, and so. Um, I, I didn't know I was going to spend probably the rest of my life in the US or <laughs> certainly have kids born in the US. I didn't know that at the time, obviously. And uh, it's been um, it's been a really interesting journey. Yeah. How did you find like, growing up in Britain, yeah. so specifically kind of like racial equality and yeah. and your experiences versus yeah. then moving to the US at that time? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, if you've ever watched the movie Blinded by the Light, it's about a, a kid in Britain um, growing up to immigrant parents who um, is of South Asian descent and and the juxtaposition of of his interests in his life, which was related to more of a Western culture and his parents having more of that South Asian culture and that pivot point, but also equally at the time where Britain was was actually more racially divided. Um, you see that time and time again when you have waves of immigrants that come into a country, a tension between the inherent uh, people that live there and the immigrants that are coming in. And, and Britain was exactly that. And I remember my mother at the time, and she instilled this in me constantly, which was you had to work twice as hard, who was somebody who's white, to succeed. And, and that was instilled in me. Um, so it, it caused me to develop a, a strong work ethic, um, but there there were barriers to progression. Um, I I could see that not just from a racial dimension, but gender, class, age, um, many different uh, dimensions, and and so I I definitely noticed that in the UK um, when I came to the US in '97. 
um, I was actually struck by more of a, at least a feeling of a meritocratic um, culture, a one in which there was seemed to be more of a correlation between hard work and results and career progression. Now, I think it's changed a lot in the UK now. And certainly when I go back, um, it's definitely more of a, um, a flatter society, more of a meritocracy than when I left it. Um, but I certainly felt that when I came to the US, there were just more opportunities to progress one's career. Yeah, interesting. I was in 97, the year you were, you were yeah. moving to the US, I was in, I was just started my A-levels in uh, Watford Grammar. And it was a very mixed school. So, you know, West Watford was a big Asian population. Um, I'm Jewish, there were a few Jews. And it was interesting because there was, there were like groups, you know, people are quite tribal. You know, you kind of like stick to your, your group. Um, everyone was very friendly. There was, of course, you know, I guess, I mean, back then you'd call it banter. Um, mm. Now you might call it something different. Um, but it was a really interesting moment um, in time. Um, quite pivotal, you know, like a lot of, you go, go through a lot of different experiences at that age. But mm. I think the one, the one thing that the, the teachers always said was, you know, you've got to build your network, you know, it's who you know. Um, and, and I think you're right. And I think in, I had a, a, my dad's friend worked in insurance at the time and, and he was, he was talking to me about, you know, like you've got to know someone and, you know, my son's going to get in because, and it was just all, ab all about the network. Mm. Um, and if you knew someone, you got in. Yeah. Um, and there were, you know, there were barriers. Yeah, I, I, I think there, I think networking is is critical, and relationships are quite critical. Um, but there, there are barriers that are oftentimes unseen. Yeah. And and it's it's um, as as a society, and now as um, the way the focus on inclusion and diversity, at many organisations are seeking to remove some of those previously unseen barriers. The dive in festival upcoming a lot of the agenda is focused around that is how do we create a more inclusive workplace and society um but but yes i mean certainly as as i've um progressed my career in in the us um one of the things that that i found was while I, it was more of a meritocratic or um, culture here there were barriers that were being experienced by other individuals such as African American, Black, Latinx, um, other other groups, and and I think what helped me, frankly, was my accent. Um, and yeah. people who people would see me in the in the U.S. and they may assume and come up with assumptions, right? We all have stereotypes around people, but as soon as I started to speak, um, it, it sort of threw them a little bit off around what those stereotypes were. And so yes. for me, I think that's been an advantage. But I I'm very cognizant today having done work particularly in the inclusion and diversity space that there are barriers that still exist for other people in an, in in our society yes absolutely a lot of it's i think you know you have a story in your mind about someone or where someone's grown up or a country and it, for me it's a lot about it, it, a lot of it's about just ch changing the narrative changing the story you know being being open to you know not everyone from this place is like that Right. Um, and, and, and so I think it takes it takes time for that to to seep through. Yeah. And you use the word story. Stories are so powerful to change somebody's perception. And, and there's a lot of research that's been done in this. And I remember encountering a professor um, who's done a lot of work around um, purpose and yeah. um, and has talked about how um, stories can um, engage the brain neurologically in ways that other thing, other ways can't. And, and when you engage um, using stories, you can start to change behaviors, you can start to impact your own purpose in, in a very meaningful way. So I, yeah. I, I think that's such a critical part is telling our stories and getting people to see us differently. Yeah. And also for me, it's just being, you know, be open and interested in, in listening to these yeah. stories because so much of our information comes from social media, yeah. a WhatsApp group, or, you know, an experience you might have had once years ago. And, and, you know, if you start to speak and engage and listen, 
there's so, you know, so many amazing stories around by so many amazing people. It might start to change the narrative in the head, in your head, which right. is, you know, complete un, you know, un, unbiased or, or, or unbiased is not the right word, but um, you know, just that 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 story that's that you've always thought to be true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cu it, look, curiosity um, and a desire to learn and understand. You know, if we if we each had that, and we start from a basis of seeking first to understand before being understood then yeah i i i'm convinced yeah. the world would be a better place yeah 100% 100% i mean look, i'm 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 certainly guilty of this i mean i i probably talk more than i listen but listen listening's great you know like asking questions taking a real interest in mm. in people and and where they're at everyone's human mm. absolutely you know how did you how did you find as you mentioned earlier that, that there was it was a, a noticeable difference between mm the UK and the US when mm. you when you go in, in what way in what way exactly how, how did you find it I, to be different? I, I, I remember um, I remember distinctly when I in the first three months that I arrived in Chicago I was invited to a client meeting and I had the opportunity to present to a senior individual at this client and if it had been six months or, or three months prior if I was in the UK that wouldn't have been the case and and partly again it was either i'm not saying it was related to my race but i think it was more related to age frankly you know i was this young um young individual why would you put somebody young in front of a senior client and ask and give them a role and and i i just remember that and then and then consistently over the next couple of years being given more and more opportunities to do that kind of thing so yeah. that I, you know, I was sort of struck by that. That that in my mind just started to say, "Huh, I, if I if I work hard, achieve good results, I'll be given more of those opportunities." And it was just this very uh, very simple equation in my mind. What what yes. was interesting was, um, I, I then worked in in the U.S. for a number of years with that belief. Um, a watershed really happened on 9/11. Um, because then, um, you know, I'd felt as though the world had changed in so many different ways. And for me, being a person of color and being born a Muslim, um, I felt that moment caused a difference in the way in which I was perceived. And I felt it, felt it as starkly when I would get in and go to an airport and being randomly pulled from a line for for questioning. I remember one time I arrived from a flight from Tokyo um, back into Chicago, 14, 15 hour flight, I can't even remember, and um, really tired and being pulled into a room for questioning for an hour and a half, something like that. And, you know, what I'd since discovered throughout all of these random checks and pull, pulled out lines was my name was similar to somebody on the no-fly list. Oh. So, um, but it, it was a, just a stark um, moment for me that caused me to think, well, you know, there is discrimination exists. It's, it isn't as simple as a straight line equation where hard work and, and results equal progression. Yeah. And, and it attuned me to, to other, other biases, other profiling that exists in, in our country today and many other countries. Yeah. How's it, how's it develop? Because my perspective is I'm living in England. Um, I have a business in America and friends and stuff, but you know, I see a lot of stuff on TV and, you know, I, I consume the media and it, and it feels like the U S has got worse over time. Is, is that, is that true? What's it like really been like? I, I, I look, I, I don't think, I actually think we've become more inclusive and diverse over time. And part of that is simply a function of the demographics. But in the year 2050, um, the Pew Research has projected that we will become a majority minority country. So there are going to be more people of color um, than they are not. And that tipping point has started to happen already at lower age cohorts. So if you look under 18s, there are more people of color than not and so that's causing 
all kinds of structural changes in the in in the country. Now that's causing tension, but it's equally causing um, the need to be more inclusive. And so whether that comes from hiring people, w employers have to be able to cast a broader net. It's it's yeah. a math problem. You've got to for you to hire talent, you've got to appeal to all types of talent. And then if you look at companies selling products in 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 the United States, they've got to appeal to all consumers. So th there is absolutely a shift. Um, and with any shift, and you've seen it over different societies in different countries, with shifts like that, um, paradigm shifts, uh, structural shifts, that leads to tension. Yeah. And so we, we're going through that right now. Um, but, but if we're grounded on certain principles, and, and if you look at the US, the US is grounded and founded on a constitution which has principles. It's principally based and it allows us to anchor how we evolve as a society to those principles. And that's, that's why I think we will get through this and we will be stronger and we are on a path of, of inclusion that isn't being turned around. Yeah, no, very true, very true. I'm interested in this as all, also, you know, there's always this, everyone's all, everyone, everyone always talks about, you know, bring your authentic self to work, yeah. you know, authenticity. And it was interesting because you saw, you know, the, the in America, you've got two political parties, very, everyone's very tribal. Um, and so do you think, you know, people really mean bring your authentic self to work or bring your authentic self to work as long as you believe what I believe? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good look. It's a good question. There's no easy answers to that. Um, you're right. We, we have become more politically polarized uh, over the last few years than, than anywhere. Um, I, I still believe that one needs to bring their entirety of their self to work um, and and be be able to be who they are at work there there is there's another part to that another dimension to that within the context of the values of that organization and so for us as an organization respect is a key value and so we bring our whole selves to work but within the context of being respectful to one another so, so I think I think it's both, right? You need to to bring your whole selves to work because that's how individuals are more engaged at work, and that's yeah. um, that's the kind of culture we're trying to create. But it has to be um, with a set of values and within the context of the values of an organization. And respectful, yeah. Because I've spoken and, to yeah. a lot of. Sorry, sorry, Carol. Yeah, you know, I was just going to say, is respectful is being is key. Yes, I, I was just going to say I've spoken to quite a lot of people and they've been struggling, struggling with this. You know, they want to they want to share more at work. Um, they want to be open, authentic, um, but have really struggled with, you know, knowing that, I don't know, the person opposite them on the Zoom now clearly, you know, feels differently about certain things. And, you know, we're always told when you grow up, don't speak about politics, don't speak about religion, don't speak about race. Um, and quite a few people quite like to speak about you know mm. debate about politics and you know it's quite nice to be able to speak to people mm. but not have an argument you know agree to disagree mm. have a have a you know an adult conversation mm. and you know become friends and build a relationship and it's mm. it's sometimes difficult at work to do that yeah it is it is and especially when um you know there's a, an individual within a group that has a contrarian view and and the rest of the group doesn't and and yeah. so that person then ends up feeling excluded which is the antithesis of inclusion yes and so <laughs> um so to to me look i don't think you can draw these hard and fast boundaries that prevent the kinds of conversations that you're talking about because because at the end of the day we're human and we're trying to engage with one another i do think it comes back to something you and i've just talked about which is this idea of seeking first to understand before being understood yeah and if we start with that premise and be inquisitive and curious in a genuine way we're more likely to to get a more productive conversation yeah very true very true also interested i mean you've obviously quite thoughtful about your leadership and how have how has your your life experience and journey and the story you, you just shared influenced your 
your leadership? Yeah. Um, you know, if I go back to, to my childhood, um, my mother um, had a career in the National Health Service in the UK as a midwife. And um, she had us, I, I'm the eldest of two, and uh, I, I was born um, when she was relatively old at that time, considering society at that time. And that's because yeah. she wanted to focus on her career. Correct. Um, fast forward, we, we encountered some family problems, uh, fa financial problems as a family. And, and my mother was an anchor around um, really supporting us during that time. So I've always had um, a very strong focus on gender diversity uh, and, and diversity more broadly. And a lot of that heralds back from the role that my mother played in raising us. Um, you know, I mentioned what she said to us um, growing up, you have to work twice as hard as somebody who's, who's white to be able to succeed. And, and so work ethic was, has been a, a strong component as well as influenced me. I'm also somewhat risk averse. Right. And, um, and, and that's something I've had to fight uh, through a little bit and um and counter that and uh, and and not immediately think about the why i should say no to something and and really think about why i should say yes to it and and yeah. that's something i've worked through so if i if i put all that together um you know i've really thought about how um i as a leader can impact others and and I've sort of framed this in my own purpose, which is this idea of unlocking and unleashing the power and potential in others so that they can experience their own purpose. And, yeah. um, and, and the leadership roles that I've had have allowed me to do that. Yeah. How did you develop into leadership? Because, you know, it's uh, a lot of a lot of people that are trans that, you know, like they want to transition into leadership. Uh, they want to create go up the career ladder. But a lot of the time early on, you know, you do well at school, down to you. You know, you enter, you go to university again, it's down to you to study. Um, if you've done team sports, you start to get some, maybe some early leadership experiences and then you start work. And again, early on in your career, it's again, it's your personal performance. And when, when suddenly when you get thrust into, you know, a leadership role, then me mentally it takes people a bit of time to, to shift from I to we. You know, did you did you yeah. did you experience that transition? Yeah, no, or... absolutely, I did. And par partly, um, you, you're absolutely right. Most people end up becoming, you know, in quotes, leaders or at least um, leading people, teams, um, th as a function of their individual contributions and a function of um, what they've done um, as in in their roles prior to becoming a leader. So then you become a leader. And you're given responsibilities on a team, but no one necessarily gives you the, the the handbook, the blueprint to say, "Here you go. Here's how you be a successful leader." So a lot of it's trial and error. Yeah. And for me, um, I I remember a mentor, and this is probably key: is is are the mentors along the way that have helped me move into these roles. A mentor said to me that um, um, we have to move away from a culture of heroes. And, and what he meant by that was prior to that as individuals, I felt as though I was con impacting the organization through my ability to sell work, deliver that work and, and, and really just grow the business in that way. And what he said was, as you transition to a leader, your role is not your individual contribution, but your ability to um, help others um, achieve what you've been able to achieve. So you equip them, you remove obstacles, you um, coach them, you sponsor them. And so that, that tr I, I've had to learn that, right? That at that pivot, when I moved from an individual contributor to a leader, and then since, since being in, in formal leadership roles, I'm constantly um, aware of other role models around me that I see doing things really effectively. You have to be attuned to that. Um, and yes. I, I, worked with some amazing people um, to be able to to be able to emulate them in certain ways. Yeah, no, I think that's great because so many people, you know, I mean, they don't like to admit it within the organization, but they really struggle with that, that that transition piece. Yeah. Um, and 
yeah you know i think for, for those watching and listening you know i think everyone goes through that yeah um you know it's okay to feel like that and and i mean the interesting the one i was i have an exec coach as well and a really interesting piece of advice is you know treat your career like a business you know you're mm. the ceo of your business yeah and don't wait for your company to provide the learning opportunities you know take ownership of your career and go get mentors go learn go listen to stuff go watch stuff and you know acquire the tools that you need to you know to go through that journey yeah no you're you're i i remember another mentor saying exactly what you just said you're the ceo of your own career and um it does it does mean there there uh it's incumbent upon you to seek out opportunities to build networks i mean that's another thing that i yeah. i've um i i've learned over the years and and i i i don't know if you're aware of myers briggs yeah it's a profile um testing and and i i'm an entj but i'm a borderline extrovert borderline right. so i i could easily slip into introvert so there are some occasions i derive my energy from other people and others i need found time yeah. but i've so i've had to develop um networking skills and and so as i've done that over the years it starts from a place of curiosity so if i'm curious about somebody it makes it it, it actually becomes very natural so when yeah. we were talking and and uh, prior you know prior to this formal conversation yeah. i yeah i i was curious about your background um and you were sharing with me just your your parents and and uh, the immigrant experience and um being yeah i think you said your family being um uh is it your grandfather that um owned the only newspaper jewish in newspaper Egypt. in cairo yeah. right yes that was yes. really interesting and i've since actually retold that to somebody else <laughs> um because i i just found that really interesting so I, I think if we um, start from a place of curiosity, networking doesn't become this alien, scary thing. It just becomes a way of learning and being interested. Yeah, and so many, so many great stories. You know, so many we've got so many th things that we share. You know, on the face of it, you know, it might look at you and I, and people in their minds might think, oh, quite different. You know, different race, yeah. age. Okay, I mean, you know, but actually, our stories aren't too dissimilar. Right. You know, if, if you get in, if you get into right. it, um, obviously they're personal to us, but it's, I think it's really, it's really fascinating. But, um, it, but it is about making those connections, right? It's also when you, when you engage with somebody, um, uh, it's human nature to look for areas of commonality, I think, right? So you, we, and we're striving to make a connection. And when you make a connection that's real and substantive, you, you just feel, you feel really good about that. You feel like, that's that that's you've connected with somebody on a human level not a superficial level but a real a deep level it's amazing and also i was a, a young guy asked me the other day you know, how do i i mentored uh, this young guy and he said you know how do i get more opportunities and so it was but either it's business or job opportunities i can't think of a better way than building a really good network you know a community of people um and to build a community, you need to spend time with people. You need to be mm. kind, um, help people. You know, do things for others. You know, and if you, you know, if you look at your, you know, career over a long period of time, I mean, you know, we're going to be working for a long time, and focus on just building a good community of people. It's it's going to, you know, really benefit you in the long term. So it's a yeah. really good way. Yeah, and I think it has it has to be grounded in authenticity. It has to be grounded in that you're not just doing it to get something out of it. You're doing it because you're, you're authentic as an individual and you're seeking to build a relationship and you're curious. Um, I, I tell you, I can spot a mile off somebody that's inauthentic and it, and it just, it really rubs me up the wrong way. Yeah. 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 The other interesting thing is a lot, a lot of people again have said, oh, it's really difficult now because I'm not going into the office. Yeah. You know, I'm not meeting people on the water cooler. Um, but I think for me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on mm. this, but I think now it's, it's such an amazing opportunity to network even more than you did before. I mean, yeah. LinkedIn, for example, is free to use. It's probably the modern day cocktail party. And everyone you're probably likely to work with now and in the future, work with as a client, they're all on there. Mm. And, 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 a, and a lot of people, are, most people love to chat. Mm. You know, they're all at home. 
Um, they want to engage and have conversations. Mm. And I think even if you're a real introvert, you probably have to dial up a little bit less courage or your extrovertness than you mm. would do if you were in a bar or in a networking mm. event in person. Yeah. Yeah. There, uh, there are pros and cons, right? There are, there are ways in which we've been able to connect with people in a virtual environment that we we would never have been able to connect to before just because of whether it be by travel or because we've been able to convene virtual forums more easily um, involving people from all kinds of uh, walks of life and and i think through those for for some of us we've created relationships and we haven't even met them i know one of the projects i worked on for 18 months there are individuals i had worked with over teams and webex that i have never met in person and i may never meet in person and yet we we got to know one another through that time um but then but there is something also to be said about the the human connection as well it was interesting coming out of the pandemic um and meeting some people that i'd been working with on zoom for for the prior 12 months or so and then meeting them in person there was something very, very different about that experience. Yeah. That there was a level of connection that um, I, I think is it can't be you. You can't surpass that with right. with um, other forms of communication and connection. So, I I think it's I. But I we, we have to evolve and adapt. And and I don't think it's a it's an or. I think it's an and. Yeah. Um, both the virtual world and the the real world. Yes. Um, being how, able to create connections. That's very true. How is, I'm really saying, how has your leadership style, if at all, changed over the last 18 months? Yeah. You've got people virtual, some coming in. I mean, and, and, and interesting, yeah. you know, how, how, how you might think that the future might look. I, I, I think it, um, I, I think you have to be a lot more intentional about connecting with people as a leader. So, you think about the 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 uh, more the pre-pandemic world when you're traveling and you're meeting people there are countless opportunities for serendipitous interactions with people that are that work in your organization right you're walking a hall and you connect with somebody randomly form a relationship or progress an issue or or there's a follow up that comes out of that conversation that that serendipitous set of interactions that there are less of those in the virtual world so yeah. unless as a leader you're purposefully connecting with people um on a one-on-one -on -one basis it's really it's really difficult to 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 emulate that prior pre pre-pandemic uh, serendipitous world so i think that's certainly yeah. one um i think the the other thing is um you you as a leader can you also have to manage your own energy yeah so what what do i mean by that it's it can be fatiguing going from um you know 7 a.m through to the evenings every day um on on these kinds of calls and what has happened i think um our work days ha have become elongated during this virtual environment and so unless you put up boundaries to that, um, it can quickly suck a lot of energy and time and then cause you to be a less effective leader. Yeah. So I think that's another piece to it is, is being able to manage that. Um, and I, I think the, I guess the third piece as a leader as well, it's recognizing that some of these Zoom calls for some people um, just as, as my energy is being depleted, um, their energy could be, and, and they also may, may be more of an introvert. So how do you engage them in a broader group? Um, and so using things like breakouts can be helpful, right? Yeah. Using the chat feature, um, to engage them in, in that, uh, in a conversation could be helpful for some of those people yeah. asking them, are they comfortable having their camera on, or is it actually better for them? you know, to turn, turn their camera off. Um, and so, you know, as a leader trying to meet people where they're at, I think is another, another um, technique that, that I've tried to employ as well.
Dan, that, that's really good because there's a lot of a lot of people over the pandemic, I and mean, there's a lot of stories of burnout. St- still is um, people in different scenarios. You know, people working in their bedrooms and parents looking after their kids when the schools mm-hmm. were shut. Well, what, what did what did you do over the pandemic to make people feel that they could be open with yeah. what, what their scenario was? Yeah, I I would say um, I mean it evolved for well, one. It evolved as we went along because we learned. Um, how how best to manage through those times. We've done things like, um, for some of our businesses said, on Fridays, let's try and limit the number of internal meetings. Let's try and come off camera when there are meetings and and have some some opportunity just to recharge, right? So that's that was one thing. We've done things like, uh, and many organizers have done this, have done things like virtual happy hours at, you know, at yeah. the end of the day to connect. Um, and and create a more of a social environment. Um, we've also um, tried to be, I think, a little bit more focused around, you know, who needs to be at, at that meeting, who who doesn't. So we're not com- uh, continually bombarding people with with meeting requests. I think another technique has said, look, block time. For yeah. some, you know, there's real simple things when you're working across different time zones. Um, you can one can be less cognizant of things like lunch times, right? So yeah. so block your lunch time, which is what I do, and I'll open it up when I need to, but I try to block it just so I can have a meal <laughs> during yeah. the day, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so there, there are just things like that where it comes back to um, the things that we've talked about: um, being authentic, seeking to understand where somebody else is in their situation. And and being empathetic to it. That's a I guess another word that we haven't used, but it's about yes. being empathetic leaders. Yeah. Um so anyway, yeah. just a few it's thoughts. So true. No, it's true. I, I've I've heard a lot of people putting a mm. fake commute in their diary yeah. at the beginning of the day. Because if you're if you're working at home, a lot of people you roll out of bed, you come into your right. office or wherever you work, and as you as you said, the days get elongated and you can forget to move. You know, it's just yeah. it's good to move in the morning. And yeah. then I, I, I personally, I put my exercise in my diary like like it's the most important meeting of the yeah. day. You know, like if I had a meeting with you, I wouldn't move it. I'm not moving yeah. my uh, I'm not moving my my gym session yeah. either. Yeah. And, and I just feel so much better when I'm yeah. doing those things. Yeah, I, I think that's important. And I I've tried to do that as well, particularly around exercise. I mean, that's. Like I go through ups and downs, I'm sure, like many people. Sometimes I'm going through a really good streak of getting my <laughs> runs in and 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 workouts, and then others, I, you know, they they go by a little bit by the wayside. But no, I'm I'm 100 with you. We've got we've got to draw boundaries. Employers, as they seek to create more inclusive environments, also have to help employees and colleagues set boundaries as well and create the environment where individuals can do that. Yes. The one thing I'm, I'm going to be honest, the one thing I'm working on, which I haven't been able to do, is leave my phone outside my bedroom in the evening because I I get sucked in. I'm looking at my emails. I'm, you know, working internationally and get email. So that's for me, that's the thing I'm working on, which I think will have a good impact on better sleep. For me. You got you got to do it. I do, I've been doing it for years. It's never in my room. Yeah, it's never, never. Put, I at the end of the day, I plug in my phone outside of my room and I, I use the, the, the bed as a sanctuary to try to just switch off and decompress. Um, oh, I think it's gonna, so, so important. I need to take your lead on that. I'm going to take your lead on that. <laughs> last, last thing before we go, I'm, I'm really yeah. interested to, to get your thoughts on maybe a few trends that you think are going to materialize over the next, you know, couple of years and h- how maybe like this, this whole work from home, hybrid working, you know, how that might end up evolving. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've never been much of a futurist when it comes to that. And I, I've got a, um, a colleague uh, and a friend who uh, we will have sometimes these conversations about the future and predictions. And I would say nine times out of 10, it's usually the opposite of what he says. <laughs> so it's a really good guide to actually figure out what's really going to happen is ask him. Um, so um, so my my view is, um, I look, I I don't I think the the workplace is going to evolve 
where yes, there'll be there'll be a hybrid um, type environment. But I think what the what the ways in which we work today um, in in the knowledge worker environment is that we've realized that there is so much inefficiency when you move to when you commute from where you are right now. So I'm in my home. And if I were to commute into work in the Willis Tower in Chicago, I'd, I'd pack my bag, I'd walk to the train, I'd get onto the train, go to Chicago, get off the train, and then walk to the Willis Tower, open up my laptop and do exactly what I could have done an hour prior. <laughs> so that just makes no sense. So, so as we think about just the role of, of the workplace, to me, it's, it's going to evolve around um, why do we come into the workplace? It's to collaborate. It's to develop people and train them. It's to um, create um, meet or develop meetings with clients and interact with clients. It's um, so there are there are specific reasons why we come into the workplace, and, and versus having the default be coming to the workplace. Now, I I think it's critical that for teams to function that there have to be interactions when teams come together. Yeah. But it, but I don't think it will be the default where people are going to do what I just described around my commute into, into Chicago. I do think we have to be careful, though, um, particularly for individuals starting out in their career. So, so you know, my son is in college. In, in three years' time, he'll enter the workplace. And um, right now, he's doing some work outside of college right now, and he's working with a lot of people he's never met before. So maybe he's going to adapt to that environment. But I do still think when you when you first join an organization and you want to meet other individuals and you want to to be part of a culture, um, in-person interaction has to be part of the equation. It may not yes. be the default, but it has to be part of that equation. Yeah, completely agree. And, and I agree that, you know, it's not going to be the same as it was. I think that's that's almost for certain. I, I mean, I'm in London in EC3 right now, uh, it's a Thursday, and I mean, there's almost no one on the streets. You know, the buildings are pretty much empty. Um, amazingly, everything's going on virtually still, right? I mean, the economy is roaring along, and right. you know, I know in America, loads of new jobs being created. But if you walk the streets right now and you'd go to the Lloyd's building and you'd have a look at, you'd think, you know, what's going on? Yeah. So. It's going to be really, really interesting. I, I, a lot of businesses I speak to, they're landing on some hybrid kind of model, you know, a few days a week, or you're in with your team, or you work from home, depending on the kind of job function that you do. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how it, it evolves. It is. I think, I think people um, during this time have, have built a lot of resilience around just their, their own their own, whatever situations they've been in, whether it be young kids or being uh, on their own during this time, it's been hard for many people. And I think there's a sense of resilience that has been built. Um, yeah. I also think there's a sense of um, change and adaptability. I, I think you're seeing people um, willing to, to move into different jobs, for example. Um, you're, you're seeing that across Certainly, the United States we call it the Great Resignation, where you've yeah. seen individuals that, that uh, move from one company to another. I think there's almost this 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 um, ability to to change and adapt more easily because of what we've gone through and a level of resilience to be able to weather through storms. So maybe that's some of the positives, but um, yeah. but I think we've noticed a little bit of that. Yeah, no, because they say you know once you've when, when you go through a, a shared experience, you know, this has been a, I mean, the world has gone through yeah. this experience together. But you always, I found from my team, we've got closer together. Mm. You know, we've been going through and helping each other mm. through this, you know, this tough moment. And I think we've got a lot closer and together through it. We've all been in our houses. You've seen people's fridges, their bedrooms, you know, wherever right. people might choose to be. And it's been a real... Yeah, it's been a really interesting experience. Yeah, yeah, it's time always is the ability to to look back and allow us to reflect. So it'll be we should have this conversation in five years' time and uh, um, <laughs> see see where we're at at this point.
Definitely. Love it. Imran, thank you so much for joining me. Really lovely to hear your story uh, and all the great things that you're doing. So thank, thank you, you so Lewis. much. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Pleasure.